Hey everyone, quick question that I want you to think about while you listen to tonight's stories. This one's going to be one that I only want you to answer if you feel safe and comfortable sharing. Have you ever had a terrifying experience with a stranger or a stalker? Maybe an ex-lover, ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, whatever. I'm curious, and like I said, if you feel safe and comfortable enough, to share that story with us, feel free to do so down in the comment section below. But for now, let's get into tonight's stories. For months, I caught glimpses of Clara from the safety of my cubicle. So beautiful, faultless. Through innocent eavesdropping and pattern recall, I unknowingly learned almost every detail of her life when she had lunch, who her friends were, and where she would be at any given moment of the workday. I even knew where she lived, as we both took the same bus to work. On the long commutes, she never did so much as batted an eye in my direction, unfazed by my existence. Admiring from afar was all I ever did, but on this day, I felt an inexplicable urge to connect with her. After settling into my workstation, I became aware of a grouping of words that made up an ominous internal dialogue. This is the day. She will be yours. My blood ran cold. The choice of words and the cadence with which they were spoken, this voice was not my own. Hello? Hello? I asked quietly, unsure if what I'd heard was even really there. A reply confirmed its presence. You need her. I stood upright, officially rattled. Who's there? By this point, everyone was staring at me, including her. smiled awkwardly. She made a perturbed look and walked away, seemingly frightened. A wonderful first exchange. (laughs) Everyone else averted their eyes and returned to work. I sat down and attempted to do the same, chalking up my bizarre experience to a lack of sleep. I sugarcoated the denial further with an internet search that backed up this theory and confirmed that audible hallucinations were also a very rare side effect of the new allergy medicine I was taking. Satisfied with my haphazard research, I craned my neck around the confines of my cubicle and noticed that Clara was shuffling some papers around at the copy machine. A strange feeling overcame me at that moment. For whatever reason, I felt I could bear the distance between us no longer. My legs began moving, opposite the signals my brain tried sending them to stop. I couldn't believe what I was doing, but infatuation seemed to outweigh my fear. I felt such a strong need to reach out and touch her. Just as I was about to take my final step in her direction, our boss came over and pulled her aside to discuss some work-related matters. I sighed in relief, shaken by my own actions. Another internet search turned up very little evidence that sleep deprivation coupled with certain antihistamines could translate to a hormone imbalance, potentially leading to an increased libido. That must have been it, I thought. Despite its many holes, this explanation sat well with me. At least for a few moments. Chase her down. Demand her attention. The voice was back. Panic set in as I dove into my work and did my absolute best to ignore the taunting as well as my new urges. This was easier said than done, especially with how often Clara walked by my cubicle to get to and from her various workplace destinations. At one point I almost grabbed her leg as she strolled past. I was able to pull my arm back with the other. Luckily she hadn't noticed. I tempered my outburst and went about business as usual. Although we went to work at the same time, 
Clara always left an hour before I did, just in time to catch the last bus. My projects ran late, so I would usually have a willing co-worker bring me home. On this day, however, it was the middle of winter. There was a storm coming. Most of the staff had left early to beat the snow. I would have been smart to do the same, but focusing on my work was the only thing keeping my mind off Claire, which in turn kept the disembodied voice at bay. Closing time snuck up on me faster than expected. Find her. I stopped at the elevator. Please. Just leave me alone, I begged in a hushed tone. The voice repeated its demand louder this time. Find her. No, I shouted, fed up but still scared. The voice responded in kind. Then suffer. All at once I stopped breathing. I felt my chest begin to cave in as the oxygen within dissipated. I fell to the floor before I could reach the phone in my station and call for help. Just as quickly as it started, the episode ended, and air once again filled my lungs. Do. Not. Disobey. This warning was enough to render me terrified. From this point forward, I had no choice but to give in to the voice's command. Some way, somehow, I would have to go to Clara. I pulled out my phone. As expected, there were no ride-sharing services available. A driving ban had just been issued due to the oncoming weather. Fantastic. Upon exiting the building without so much as a long sleeve shirt to keep me warm, I headed off in the direction of Clara's home, backtracking over the route taken by our bus. It would take me roughly four hours to get to her by foot. Knowing this, I made long and firm strides in the hope of minimizing the amount of time it would take me to reach her. While walking down Main Street in this fashion, I noticed a lot of businesses closing up for the night due to the approaching blizzard. One of these shops was at the local florist's. A gift. Knowing what the voice had in mind, I pushed the door open just as the florist was about to lock up, startling the hell out of her. I grabbed the nearest rose I could find, threw some money down on the counter, and left in haste. I did not wish to feel my lungs collapse again. I began power walking to Clara's house, hoping I would beat the storm there. Before making it too far, I felt a sharp pain in my hand. I looked down and saw droplets of blood splattered across the ground. It was the rose. I grabbed an uncut one, thorns and all. My palm was now bleeding profusely, but I kept walking. The voice returned to encourage me, but this time it was faint, barely a whisper. She's waiting for you. I trudged through harsh winds, my pace never wavering. The storm was closing in. At about the halfway point, I felt snow. It began falling at a swift and steady rate, making it almost impossible to see in front of me. I stood still with my back to the current in an attempt to catch my breath, but another whispered incentive kept me going. Continue. I pressed on feeling the sting of the snow on my bare face. After an hour or so, a mark formed on my arm. It was beginning to turn black. This was the onset of frostbite, I guessed. It only grew darker as time went on. The other soon followed suit. I could only assume the rest of my skin was turning as well. I was concerned, but not enough to falter and face the deadly consequences. After another long and treacherous hour, I finally arrived at her street. Be with her. The lawn was covered in snow, but I could still see the stone walkway leading the way to the front door. I took a step onto it, but quickly fell to the ground, slipping on a sheet of ice. My arm met the unforgiving ground below. It was more than likely broken, but I couldn't feel a thing. I stood up and kept walking. Having more than likely heard the sound of my fall, Clara opened the front door and walked out to meet me. 
She said nothing. She simply looked at my frostbitten and disfigured form with a horrified expression. She raised her hands over her mouth in shock. I reached up and presented her the rose. I had little energy left to speak, but I managed to offer her a couple of words. For you. She stared at me, just as she had earlier. Those eyes of disgust, that look of confusion. It was now turning into sheer terror. Before I could offer an explanation, she began to scream. She screamed so loudly that a splitting pain consumed my ears. My feelings for her would not be reciprocated. Without warning, a swirling vortex of red energy burst from my frozen skin and hung above us. We both cowered in its presence. Before we could escape, the entity rushed to Clara and wrapped itself around her arms and legs, pinning her in place. An all-too-familiar sound ringed through the stormy night, and I understood what was happening. The voice was no longer happy with Clara. Kill her. Just as it had earlier in the day, my body moved without me. My arm was raised, and I noticed a red glow emanating from the rose, similar in color to the entity. I was compelled to strike Clara, to slash her open with its thorns. I did my best to resist, but my possessed legs quickly closed the gap between us. As my arm wound up for the attack, I cried out, No! I yelled, to which the entity responded, Do as you are told. I can't quite explain it, but... In this bleak moment, an idea sprung to mind. Less a thought than it was a feeling. A last-ditch effort to fight back. Okay, okay. I'll do it. Just please, release me. Very well. Make it quick. My restraints were lifted. I was surprised it had complied, but I did my best not to show it. Then I looked at Clara with saddened eyes. I'm sorry. I swung the rose and struck skin. Blood poured onto the snowy ground. My blood. What are you doing? I sliced open every inch of skin I could see, and in a low whisper the voice pleaded with me. No. Stop this at once, I beg of you. Clara was freed of her binding and ran back into the house, and I kept cutting until there was a pool of red surrounding me, and I fell into it and lost consciousness. When I woke, I was in a hospital bed. To my left was Clara, asleep in a chair, I was in a great deal of pain, but it seemed my wounds had been attended to. Better yet, I no longer felt the darkness within. I guess my plan worked. I tried to get up, knocking over my IV in the process. The noise woke Clara. You're awake. Please, lie back. You need your rest. Her eyes were just as beautiful as I remembered. Are you okay? I asked. I'm fine, just a little frazzled and confused is all. She picked up the IV and handed me a glass of water. What was that thing? How did you stop it? I had to dwell on it for a second to recollect all the details. I don't know. It was a strange sensation I became aware of. I felt as though it was tied to my veins in some way, a, a blood demon of sorts. Without my blood, it couldn't survive. She stared at me, silent. Yeah, you probably think I'm crazy, don't you? She shot me an infectious smile. I was there too. I heard it, saw it even. If you're crazy, then we both are. We laughed. 
far better exchange than my first if I was keeping score. The rest of the day was nice. We talked for hours and really got to know each other. Before she left, Claire promised she would visit the following day. For a brief window, things were looking really good. But then, a familiar voice broke through, shattering the illusion. I told you, she would be yours. I've always liked to think of myself as something of an urban explorer. There are a ton of derelict buildings in my hometown, and I've visited each one. I found nothing of interest in many of them, but did find a group of mannequins that had been set up as if they were having a dinner party. I was running out of places to explore when I thought of the Miller Quarry, which had been closed for nearly 20 years. It used to be the main employer in our town until the money ran out and everyone was laid off. It turned our once prosperous town to a bit of a ghost town. It took me almost half an hour to cycle there and I had to hop over a fence to get inside. I stupidly got my trousers caught on the top of the railing and had ripped them to get them off. I went through my bag of supplies and made sure I had everything I could possibly need. I made my way inside while gazing around at all the machinery that now lay rusted and forgotten. I was making plans on how I should spend my day as I reached the top of the quarry. I stopped dead in my tracks while peering downwards at what lay beneath. There appeared to be what looked like a giant man who covered nearly the entire floor of the quarry. He was wearing a robe that was torn in many places and had long white hair. He lay unmoving on the ground with his head lying to the side as if he was asleep. I stood there, speechless, while my brain tried to comprehend what I was looking at. I began to feel lightheaded and realized I hadn't breathed in nearly a minute. I took a few deep breaths and started moving into the quarry. My eyes never left his face as I walked towards him. His size dwarfed anything I'd ever seen in my life. My best estimate is that his body was about a mile or more in length. Everything about him was incredible and I stood in awe of what I had found. I initially thought he'd fallen from the sky, but noticed that the ground around him was flat, as if he had just laid down. If he'd fallen, there would have been an earthquake due to the force of his body hitting the ground. I made my way toward his face and stopped when I saw his eyes. It looked like something had been cutting into his eyes as I could see bloody pulp dripping down his face. I did a full 360 degree turn as I felt like someone was watching me. I couldn't see anyone, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was someone else here. The quarry was lined with shadows and an entire army could be around me and I might not even see them. I once again turned back to his face and watched in amazement as one of his eyes began twitching. I let out a scream as a black demon ripped its way out. It launched itself into the sky and landed behind me. I spun around to face it and felt fear running through my body. The creature looked like a crow, but the proportions were all wrong as it was twice the height of me. It stared at me, seemed to be judging me. It let out an ear-splitting caw and threw itself into the air. Its cry was answered by dozens of other cries as dozens of similar creatures appeared from crevices hidden along the length of the quarry. They began flying over my head, which reminded me of vultures circling their prey. Blood was dripping from them as they had obviously been feasting on his flesh. I barely had time to react when one of them suddenly spiraled down toward me. I threw myself to one side, but its claws cut into my shoulder. I began to panic, as I knew there was no way I could get past these abominations. I had to avoid two more attacks and was near exhaustion at this point. I made a split-second decision and began racing toward the giant's body. The cries from above became deafening as I reached his face. His mouth was partly open, and I began to push my way inside. I felt something brush against my back as I finally managed to make it inside. One of the crows was trying to follow me, but it was unable to open the mouth further. 
It pushed its claws in a desperate attempt to drag me out, but I retreated away until I finally gave up. I let out a sigh of relief and looked around at me at what now could end up being my prison. The mouth was being lit by a strange orange light that was coming from his flesh. I expected there to be a rancid smell due to him being dead, but strangely, it smelled like freshly sliced lemons. I checked my shoulder and was relieved to see that the injury was only minor as the crow's claws had only grazed me. I ate and drank a small amount to replenish my strength while trying to decide what my best course of action could be. I kept gazing over toward his throat and wondering what would wait me down there. My decision on what I should do was forced on me as the crows made another attempt to get inside at me. They were using their claws as levers and were trying to pry open the mouth. I rushed toward the throat as one of the crows was now halfway inside. I ran down the length of the throat, feeling the floor beneath me sink with every footstep. The calls of the crows faded as I got further away from them. I finally reached an immense open space and halted while looking around. I could see his ribs high above me as they dwarfed any building I'd seen in my life. There were a few cracks noticeable on them as if they'd been broken somehow. I heard a thunderous noise above me and looked up to see a giant maw lowering itself toward me. I could see lines of teeth inside that seemed to be swirling around like the bottom of a lawnmower. I began running up to the cavern before it could engulf me, and I looked over my shoulder and saw it had stopped and now stood still. I slowed down to catch my breath and spotted more of these creatures in the distance. They made me think of the worms that had somehow been turned into demonic entities. They were slow moving, so all I had to do was stay well away from them to survive. They were using their teeth to eat away at the flesh that lined the cavern. They seemed to grow in size every time they ate a chunk of meat. I found a corner that was well away from anything and had cover on nearly all sides. I knew that it would be dangerous, but I needed to sleep. I fell asleep with the picture of that worm's mouth floating above me. I woke the next morning to what sounded like boulders being flung about. I peered out of my hiding space to see the worms fighting against dozens of four-legged insects. The insects had spikes embedded in their heads which they used to pierce the worm's hide. Neither side seemed to have an advantage as soon as the cavern was littered with their dead and dying corpses. I grabbed my things and began to make my way toward the far end of the cavern. I had to dodge numerous attacks, but luckily they were more interested in killing each other than trying to get to me. I was almost crushed at one time as one of the insects was thrown in the air and landed an arm's throw away from where I was. I reached the far edge of the cavern after almost an hour of walking and looked back to see the battle was finally over. The worms had wiped out the surviving insects and were now feasting on their flesh. I continued my journey and almost screamed in joy as I saw sunlight up ahead. I made my way through a long, narrow tunnel until I reached the tip and cautiously looked out. There was no sign of any crows and there was a forest in the distance. I crawled outside and looked back to see where I'd crawled out of. I laughed at myself as I thought this guy would definitely be a hit with the ladies. I managed to make it to the forest but heard the screeches of the crows who were still circling. I now lie on my couch wondering if I should tell someone. How do you tell the world that you think you found God's corpse? I'm traveling on a flight from New York back to my home country of Ireland. I went over to spend New Year's with a couple of friends who moved over there a few years ago. It was really nice catching up with them as I haven't seen them in so long. A bit of backstory about myself is that I'm a 23-year-old female who's constantly being mistaken for a teenager. This can be really irritating as it means I'm always asked to provide ID any time I'm going out. I booked a window seat on the flight home as I wanted to enjoy the view. I was one of the last people to board the plane as I wasn't in a rush as they wouldn't leave without me. I arrived at my seat and discovered an older couple sitting in both of the seats. I pointed out that the window seat was mine and would they mind moving. 
The woman looked at me like I told her that I liked her mustache. She started scolding me and pointing out that I should respect my elders. One of the stewardesses came up to see what was going on and I showed her my ticket. The stewardess asked the woman to move, but she refused. I could see a small grin across the stewardess's face as she turned to me and said that there was a spare seat in first class so I can sit up there for the flight. The old woman started sputtering away as I was led to my new seat. I thanked the stewardess, whose name was Anne, as I sat down. She laughed and said it was no problem, before walking off to check on the passengers. I felt an unpleasant bump against my shoulder and turned to my side to discover an overweight balding man leering at me. He started talking to me and I could see his eyes were glued to my chest. He told me that we should get a hotel room together once we reached Dublin. I used my favorite trick to get rid of unwanted advances by loudly exclaiming that I was 15 and to please leave me alone. His eyes bulged out of his sockets as he quickly moved away. Anne came back a few minutes later offering complimentary glass of wine and I gladly took it as alcohol usually helps me sleep better on flights. I could see the balding man glaring over at me as I sipped on the drink. I eventually finished it and lay back down to get a few hours of sleep on the flight. I was awoken by a hand roughly shaking my shoulder. I gazed up at the balding man and was about to tell him to fuck off when I saw the expression on his face. His face was deathly pale and he looked terrified. He placed his finger over his mouth to tell me to be quiet and then pointed down toward the far end of the plane. I stood up and stared and couldn't see what he meant. There were only passengers sitting in their seats and nothing out of the ordinary. My blood ran cold as I finally looked into the faces of the other passengers. Their eyes were all blood red and they were sitting there with giant toothless smiles. Their smiles seemed way too big and looked like their faces were being ripped open to increase the size of the smile. They all appeared to be staring right at me and seemed to enjoy the horror on my face. I turned around to talk to the balding man, but he'd walked over to a group of about ten other people, including Anne. I almost sprinted across to tell them, as I didn't want to be alone with whatever those other things were. They were all talking in whispers and were in the middle of an argument. The balding man, whose name I discovered was Kevin, was trying to convince Anne to tell the pilot to turn around. She kept telling him that we were already halfway there, so it wouldn't make much sense. I interrupted their conversation as I needed to find out what in the actual fuck was going on. No one had any explanation and said that Anne was the first to notice something was wrong and by that time, most of the other passengers were affected. The small group that were gathered here are the only ones who haven't turned into smilers. Kevin laughed at the name she'd given them, and I almost jumped as it was so loud. I gazed over at the smilers and decided to have a closer look at them. Their eyes bored in my skull as I slowly moved toward them. I got as close to them as I dared and realized the closest people were the old couple from earlier. There was blood pouring from their mouths into their laps. Their teeth lay forgotten on the floor and they appeared to be rotting and turning black. I asked the woman if she was okay. She smiled at me and told me, Take a seat, everything's going to be fine. Her grin got even bigger and her jaw seemed to dislocate to accommodate it. I stood there, frozen in panic, when I felt something shove into my back and fell forward, hitting my head on the way down. Everything went black as I lost consciousness. I awoke with a dull thudding in my head and my vision was a bit blurry. I glanced around and realized that I was back in my seat. Anne rushed over to help me and put her arms around me to ensure I didn't fall. Kevin walked over and immediately started apologizing as he had tripped earlier and had knocked me over. I accepted his apology as I felt bad for him as he looked terrified. There were very obvious pit stains under his armpits and sweat was pouring down his face. I was feeling a bit better a few minutes later than thanked Anne. I slowly walked over to gaze down the plane. 
I was met with a sea of hideous faces. All the passengers were now bald as their hair had fallen off and lay forgotten in the aisles. They all gazed at me with the same maniacal smile. They all said in unison, Take a seat, everything's going to be fine. I fled back to the others and was surprised when I noticed there were fewer of us now. Kevin told me they'd started changing while I was unconscious and were not sitting with the other infected. I did a quick count and was shocked to discover there were only five of us left. The other two were a pair of teenagers who were flying to Ireland to spend time with their grandparents. Their names were, ironically, Jack and Jill. They begged me to not make fun of their names as their parents were a bit weird. I promised not to, as all families have their own quirks. I asked Anne what did the pilot say about all this, and her face dropped. She led me to the cockpit and opened the door and refused to enter. I walked inside, felt my heart plummet. Both the pilot and co-pilot were staring at me with pus oozing from their cheeks. I quickly exited the cockpit as they started repeating, Take a seat, everything's going to be fine. Anne explained that they'd been trying to contact for help when they suddenly stopped talking and then just started smiling. Thankfully, the plane was on autopilot, so we didn't have to worry about suddenly crashing. We barricaded off a section of the plane so that we would at least be able to feel a bit safer. I don't really see the point, as they haven't left their seats, but it seems to make everyone else feel better. We took turns watching them so that we could have a nap. I was roughly awoken again by Kevin and was about to chastise him until I realized that Jack and Jill were missing. Kevin pointed over the barricades when I saw the realization on my face. I looked over the barricade and saw them, sitting with the others. They had the same smile and I could see them slowly starting to change. I thought I could hear something and came to the sickening realization that they were quietly chanting, Take a seat, everything's going to be fine. Do they keep saying that? What does it mean? Anne, Kevin, and myself sat there trying to decide what to do. We knew we were in trouble as Jack and Jill had seemed fine less than an hour ago. We couldn't tell if whatever was affecting them was airborne or how it traveled. I heard a commotion and quickly rushed to see what the fuck was going on. I came to a dead stop and had to grab onto a nearby chair to steady myself as I watched what was unfolding before me. Each of the infected were digging into their eyeballs with their nails and attempting to rip them out. I almost vomited as Jack managed to rip his eyeball out before throwing it into his mouth. There was a sickening pop as he crunched it between his teeth. I vomited under the nearby seat before turning and getting as far away from them as possible. Kevin came over to me and offered me a drink of water to get rid of the taste of vomit. He plopped down to the seat beside me and didn't say anything. He just appeared to be gazing off into space. I was trying to decide what I should do next when I heard him mumbling something to myself. I felt a shiver down my spine as I realized he was now saying, Take a seat, everything's going to be fine. I looked at him and knew that he didn't even know what he was saying. I don't know what came over me, but I just got up out of my seat and slapped him across the face. He looked at me in shock while clutching his reddening face. I didn't say a word and just walked away as I needed to gather my thoughts. The infected had finished their earlier task and I was met with dozens of stairs with empty eye sockets. I know that it may sound crazy, but I can honestly feel their eyes on me. They all opened their mouths and began to scream, Take a seat, everything's going to be fine. They screamed it as one voice and it made me want to stab knives into my ears to block out the noise. I went to find Anne and let out a scream as I found her in the middle of eating our own eyeballs. I wanted to stop her, but I knew it was too late. She smiled at me after she finished eating. I gazed down at her once pretty face that now looked like a scene from a slasher movie as her face was now so distorted. Heaven was my last hope and I practically sprinted over to him and collapsed on the ground as I looked into his face. There was something moving in his empty eye sockets, and it seemed to be beckoning to me. Take a seat. Everything's going to be fine. I'm 
I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know why I wrote that. I'm all alone up here and know that the flight is meant to be landing soon. I don't know what to do, but I know that I should take a seat and everything's going to be fine. Please, help me. <laughs> 